Karma is not a fest from Telu Talks in partnership with the 232. Initiative. Session 2. Sarah Halpin, the Digital Communications Manager at the Irish National Opera, INO, is a classically trained musician now working in digital communications. INO, as Ireland's national opera company, produces high quality accessible opera in venues throughout Ireland and overseas, including a strong digital platforms use policy. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you, Sarah Halpin, uh, for coming or accepting our invitation to come to Visio, so to speak, uh, in order to, for this set of interviews regarding public space and, and, and eventually how, how the new dynamics, uh, especially digital dynamics, are influencing the, the way, well, some institutions and some people work. Um, uh, Sarah, you're the digital communications manager uh, for the Irish National Opera, um, but this hasn't changed much of what you already do at... Uh, well, it uh, hasn't, it hasn't. Uh, um, first of all, uh, thanks very much for having me and it's great to be chatting with you today. Um, sorry, I'm not in Portugal in real life, it would be much nicer. Um, yeah, like I've been working with Irish National Opera for two years now. Uh, the company is only three years old. Um, and since I started there, there's been quite a, a heavy focus on digital um, as, as a tool and as a channel. Um, so we're quite a small company. Um, we're just 10 people. So to have a role like mine, which is digital communications manager in such a small team for an opera company is, is usual. So there, there has been a focus in the company from before COVID happened and before all this new way of working happened. There, there has been a focus in the company on digital space and on digital communication and, and using digital tools to engage audiences and to find new audiences and to, to make new experiences that people can, can see online and engage with online. Um, so COVID has changed the way we do things, um, but I think that we were well placed to, to jump on that train when it started to move. We were kind of keen to do it anyway. So it's, it's definitely been an acceleration for us, but, but it's something that we were, had an eye to anyway. And um, being, being small and new, um, do you think, and being prepared for, from the start in terms of stra strategy, if you will, for, for I know, um, uh, Irish National Opera, I know, um, do you believe that, that when all of this uh, came to be, um, the way you responded, uh, I, I will make a parenthesis, one of the things I was, I was very, very interested in was that the way you communicated, in, for instance, in, in Twitter, um, you, you would uh, regard or, or, or place content uh, in the way it was um, a show or a regular show that people would have time uh, to, to be connected, but, but your, your musicians or your artists, everyone that interacted officially, was, was very uh, relaxed, laid back, as if it wasn't really uh, heavy to, to belong to, to, to yeah. a national opera. It's a national opera. Yeah, I think there's a couple of things there. I think, you know, one, being Irish, I think, you know, we have a relatively small community in Ireland of, of artists and of arts organizations. and you know, people are very supportive and very friendly and um, very encouraging of each other. So there's a lot of, um, there's a safe space, I think, in some ways for people to engage online and to kind of share their views and share their feelings. Um, also, when you're working in the arts and when you're working specifically with the performing arts, so with kind of opera singers or actors, um, and you're asking them to engage with you on online content, so either to, you know, host a, a a session or to do an interview or to present themselves in some way online they're very used to standing on a stage and presenting to an audience of thousands of people so when you actually just put a camera in front of them it can be quite a, a simple shift for them to change like we're very lucky in that we have artists who are very comfortable presenting themselves and what they do and they have seemed to make the shift to doing that in front of a camera quite seamlessly. I'm, it's really impressive. Like when I think of some of the things that I ask for artists to do, and I think, would I be able to do that? Probably not. But, you know, we're lucky in this industry in that they, they are communicators at heart. You know, I think that that's what opera is all about. It's all about um, finding ways to connect with the human experience. And, and the singers on stage are just finding ways to connect with 
individual audience members in the audience and and whether you do that in a theater or whether you do that online it's pretty much the same thing so they really bring that core performance um and just shift it to an online context and i think the more you can find similarities um, between what happens in the real world and what you bring to your online content and kind of keep that audience connection at the heart of everything you do, then it, it kind of makes the transition less scary and a bit more seamless. You said two things uh, that, if you, if you don't mind, uh, one of them was, was the notion of real versus virtual. Um, mm -hmm. and, and the other one, you mentioned something as a positive and as a plus that uh, they were so used to, to, to performing for bigger audiences that a smaller audience or, well, was seamless. The transition mm -hmm. was seamless. Um, and, and it is curious that, for instance, some museums or other institutions, they found it really hard to, uh, to talk to a camera in their own home where they would be secure the, the notion of privacy and private space versus public space mm -hmm. um, really uh well came to be a barrier um, for you that wasn't you didn't feel well potentially for us it, it goes back to the kind of kind of people we're working with as well a, a lot of our artists are much younger demographic they're used to talking on their own social media a lot you know a lot of them would do their own kind of video diaries from from rehearsals, you know, on their Instagram stories or whatever. So, so they're, they're more comfortable with a camera through social media use, perhaps that maybe some other demographics are. Um, so yeah, I wonder, does that have something to do with it? I, I think the, the interesting thing of coming into people's homes, I think that's been a really kind of curiosity of COVID. I think there's, there's lots of studies. You can probably do that about that in years to come. Um, I know that, well, I feel that audiences have really relished that insight into into kind of the people that we connect with, you know, in, in like, you know, that you go to the theater and you see somebody and then the opportunity to then see them in their home, I think has been really valuable and, and interesting. And it's been a kind of an interesting takeaway from all of this. But um, yeah, for the most part, people have, have been very open to it. We've had very little resistance. Um, to, to explain, you, you said already that uh, your function, your specific role was something unusual to, to have from the start. Uh, when we first exchanged some words, you, you said it would be more natural for an institution to have a marketing manager that would take care of social media, for instance, than to have a communications, digital communications manager. Um, and one other thing was that, um, well, that is interesting in itself in the positioning, uh, the other thing is, well, being so new, um, what was the interest of, of creating the Irish National Opera? What was the goal and the goals or objectives? Have they shifted or is it, is it too soon to, to, to have it, some mm. other strategy? I don't think the goals have changed. I mean, I basically Irish National Opera um, was founded because there wasn't provision for a national opera company. Mm -hmm. And we had a number of smaller opera companies doing different things and serving different audiences. So there was an opera company called Opera Ireland who put on, I think they had maybe two seasons a year. So they would put on main scale opera productions in Dublin, in the capital. Um, and that would be, you know, a number, a handful of productions a year. And then there was um, a company, a touring company called Opera Theatre Company, and they would tour smaller productions to local venues in around the country. So they wouldn't get to every county in, in the country, but they would get to a number of smaller venues. So providing opera for people who wouldn't be able to make that trip to Dublin. Um, opera Ireland was disbanded for a number of reasons many years ago. And so our company, Irish National Opera, kind of came together to combine those two functions. So we really do have a, a remit and a, and a responsibility for national reach. Mm -hmm. So providing opera on a national level. And we do that. We, we provide main scale productions in Dublin, which are kind of larger things like, you know, Puccini and Verdi and Mozart mm -hmm. operas. And, um, and then we take smaller touring things. So like our recent touring production was of Humperdinck, Hansel and Gretel. And we'll take those in kind of, you know, they, they might have reduced orchestrations, which facilitate us getting into smaller venues and smaller theatres. So we bring them to as, as kind of many places as possible. And then I think what really where the digital side has come is that we see the potential in digital to extend that reach even further. So, you know, you might be able to in future bring a virtual reality opera to like an island off the west coast of Ireland. And then you, you manage to reach people there or you manage to 
you know, through captured content, we managed to provide streams of your operas online that people can reach given their broadband situation. So for us, the digital is really um, to capitalize on, on the reach and to get to as many places in Ireland as we can so that no one's excluded from the opera experience. Um, you know, we, we believe that there's the potential for everyone to enjoy opera. We don't believe that everyone will enjoy opera, of course, not everyone is going to love it. Um, and we accept that, but we would like to give the opportunity to everyone to at least try it um, and to see if it, it is for them. And then if it is for them, that we can provide a space for them to engage. Whether it's real uh, with a yeah. physical venue or digital. Yeah. And for me, I think the really interesting space comes where you combine the two. Um, like, I think digital has huge power and, and possibility and opportunity. And real life experiences have huge power and possibility and opportunity. And then if you combine the two, so as your digital world is an enhancement or an extension of your real life world, you, you allow yourself the opportunity to really deepen the relationships with the people who engage with you in real life. And you give them a place to kind of come back to you and reinforce that relationship. Mm -hmm. um, and also to, to share news and to share or their experience with you with other people that they might um, think like it. So other people in their circle, and then they become advocates for the art form and for your productions and for your, your artists. And so I think it has the potential to encourage growth and encourage real deep engagement. Whereas if you just do it in the physical space, you can have that with just the people in the room, but it's hard to then expand that outside. So um, if, if and the main advantages in this, in this segment of, of analysis, if you will, is um, one, the insight people do get, uh, you mentioned that a few minutes back, they do have insight on, on something they wouldn't usually, and that engages people also, and they can, they can be engaged and be part of the community uh, that you are building by having social media and, and a more personalized interaction. Um, well, uh, doubling down on that, do you really consider um, throughout these three years and eventually on, on into the future that people uh, consider themselves as part somehow, not being the artists, not being the performers, but part of the, of the spirit of the Irish National Opera, they consider themselves to be in, yeah. included? I mean, I hope so. Like, obviously not everyone who engages with us will. Um, and people engage on many different levels. Um, we're working hard uh, to develop a kind of a strong uh, supporter base, um, you know, and that there is a, a core audience of opera lovers in Ireland who have supported opera, you know, way before Irish National Opera was a thing. You know, they would have been supporters of the previous companies that were in existence and they continue to be supporters. And, and what we're interested in is building on those relationships and building the next generation of those relationships. Mm -hmm. um, and if digital will allow us the tools to kind of get the next generation through and to build those consistent, you know, engagement after engagement after engagement, um, that's really positive for us. So I don't think that everyone will feel that deep connection, mm -hmm. but I think enough people will to make it worthwhile. One thing, one thing about this, this interaction, you have had, well, that I knew of, of course, uh, you've had uh, a few, let's call it programs, um, uh, if, if you won't mind me using the word. Yes. Um, one of them was Seraglio. Um, yes. And can, can you speak a bit about it? it yeah. So um, as part of our last season, um, we were due to do a performance of Mozart's The Abduction from the Seraglio. Um, and that was due to take place in one of the main theatres in Dublin here at the Gaiety Theatre in May of this year. So obviously that was cancelled due to COVID. Um, we had already contracted all the artists and, you know, everyone was expecting to go to work. Um, and, you know, we felt like we had a responsibility to those artists to try and find a way to, to keep them employed. Uh, so as a way of doing that and, and as a way of kind of keeping the art alive and keeping activity going and, and you know, showcasing that opera can be so many different things and, and it, it was a really good opportunity to experiment in what opera could be we took that opera and we reimagined it so the original director who was due to direct it on on the stage just went back to the drawing board and reimagined it as an eight-part uh, internet miniseries so we took kind of 
there was the overture and then there was seven, there was the end kind of chorus and then six other arias in the opera that kind of told the basic story. And they were uh, made into eight, uh, they ranged between about five minutes and I think the longest was maybe nine or 10 minutes, little episodes. And each one was filmed, you know, in isolation. So the conductor was in his house, the, all the instrumentalists, it was with the Irish Chamber Orchestra, who's one of our um, orchestras here in Ireland. All the instrumentalists were in their own home. The director was in her house. The video editor was obviously in her house. So everything was filmed in their own homes on mobile phones, recorded, they had available. And then it was given to video editors and sound editors who brought it all together under the direction of the director, Katrina McLaughlin. Um, and yeah, so we put that out as an eight part series and we did it on social media and on YouTube so people could tune in in whichever capacity was available for them. And it was really successful. Yeah, we had a really good response. It was, I mean, for the company, the engagement with the artists was hugely important. And um, being able to create that work uh, in what was a really challenging environment. And, you know, you were talking about kind of people, uh, the artists being able to pivot to this new way of working, like they just took to it, which must have been such a strange thing to do, you know, singing in your bedroom where you're used to being on a stage with an orchestra of 60 accompanying you you're now in a bedroom with a headphone and just listening to a piano track so it was a completely new way of working and they just took to it um so instinctively and yeah created a really something really different um that kind of was definitely more than the sum of its parts um and quite unique to its situation so we're really proud of it yes one of the things was that in some comments or retweeting or whatever, um, the, the, the ones that were part of the, of the miniseries were, were all, uh, I was feeling, feeling awkward, but well, let's do this again. I, I like the way we could do something. The notion of empowerment was for them that are people uh, used to, to be in front of, well, gatherings, but they, 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 in their words, they were saying they were empowered by this new situation and the way they could produce opera. Uh, mm -hmm in the way you, you just described it. it was very Yeah, and I think there's a great democratization with all of this digital technology. I mean, one of the, the conductor actually who worked on that opera, uh, his name is Peter Whelan, incredibly creative guy. And he in lockdown built a whole, uh, he, he put out a series of videos where he did, he, he's a conductor, he's a bassoonist, and he's also a harp scored keyboardist. Um, and he can sing a bit. So he, he put out these incredible videos where he would play or sing Bach um, cantatas, playing the bassoon part, playing the harpsichord, singing the lines, acting a little bit. So like musicians have been able to really uh, explore their creativity in a completely different way than they would ever have thought they'd never have had the time to do, the inclination to do, the thought to do. And this crisis, you know, with people sitting at home wondering what this means for them, they've, they've really kind of, a lot of people have really risen to it and, and just come up with extraordinary new ways. So I think that for a lot of artists, you know, organizations kind of starting them on this journey or kind of pushing them into this way has meant that they've explored new technologies, new ways of recording, new ways of interacting artistically that I think they will go on to use themselves in their own creative paths. So I think the more that organizations kind of explore this stuff, the more skills artists get and they go off to create on their own side. So I think it's, it's a general raising of, of skills and ideas and creativity. One question that you probably don't have an answer right now, but um, do you feel that at least part of this, part of this uh, skill set or the, this kind of experimentation will be uh, incorporated into institutions in general? Uh, do, you mean, do you mean organizations um, creating more of this work or do you mean in terms of education? Well, uh, both a little both? bit. It's, it's the notion that um, when this was done, it was usually done because of a lack of an alternative. Yeah. Um, when the alternative comes, uh, will they feel awkward by doing it? Uh, or will they um, incorporate that into their own, well, dynamics? Yeah, I mean, personally, and I suppose I have a, I have a bias in this area due to my <laughs> job. Um, I, I hope that things will have changed, will be changed by this. I think that they will. I think that in general, the way humans interact, connect, 
um, you know, the way we live our day to day lives will will be somewhat changed and changed permanently. Um, I think organizations, specifically arts organizations, will always struggle with funding and will always struggle with resourcing. So, you know, I imagine that when we get back into a situation where we can be back in theatres, you know, resources will be and, and rightly so allocated mm -hmm. to doing that and to kind of going back to that life experience. But what I would be aiming for in our organization and what I hope that a lot of organizations will have kind of learned or or will have seeped into their DNA somewhat is that we will always now need to have this underlying um, digital provision. Like we need to have this as part of our DNA as organizations because we never know when this is going to happen again. You know, we've seen where we've seen the new way that the world is is moving towards in terms of communication. So we need to be prepared to respond in that way. And I think pretending like it, it isn't a thing just isn't really good enough. I think we have to accept that digital is here and it's here to stay. And there are many ways to go about engaging with it. But I think that organizations owe it to themselves and they owe it to the people they work with and the people they work for um, as in audiences and community. They, we owe it to each other to make sure that we go in with our eyes open and know what's coming down the road. So, yeah, I think that hope uh, from INO's perspective before COVID, most of our digital engagement was around marketing and communications or around disseminating real life experiences in a digital version. And what I would hope coming out of that, this is that we can start to build strategies that do those two things, but also build in a third layer of purely you know digitally digitally devised and created content so creating digital content specifically for the platforms that we're looking at and and the digital audiences that we're looking to reach straight shooting questions regarding what what you said you do feel it's more democratic the possibility of creating online or digitally supported yeah i think in future you'll see a lot more artists creating their own content for digital spaces and do you believe institutions will also embrace that that creation? Someone from Portugal, they do nothing about be able to to well eventually get a phone call and say, well, sing with us. Do you believe it will also be democratic in that sense? It's, sorry, can you repeat that question? It's Someone with that. less pedigree um, to be to be called upon to participate um, into well a production uh, because. If that, what you were saying, that eventually people will have the chance to produce online and produce at a distance, um, eventually the, the notion of no boundaries or no barriers or no um, well limits will allow, well, I'm in Viseu, you're in Dublin and we're speaking. Uh, will it be possible to work, actually work in terms of art and productions, big scale productions, um, without having a pedigree well i knew someone i i found interesting let's invite them to yeah to be here. absolutely yeah i think so um do you hope so b before thinking so do you hope so will, will that yeah. be positive yeah i mean i think already you know people like to create with people that they have a creative connection with. And I think that's, that's the, the kind of key driver for creativity is that, you know, you, you connect with people, you have a spark, you have a mutual understanding of what you want to do and what you want to achieve. And I think those are the real criteria and then everything else kind of works around that. The idea was, well, it is democratic, it is wider. Um, do you believe people will accept our um, highly professional, but less formal? Um, situations do you think that is a, a, a way or that people will want formal uh, presentations formal in terms of uh, to to obey a certain process or ruling or presentation uh, because a, a lot of people now were, were speaking out of out of their pajamas so to speak right? eating a toast drinking coffee yeah. and that was acceptable do you believe that will still be acceptable or will uh, translate into something else i think that I think that there's space for maybe, I think that in the future, there's space for more ways to experience things and, and there's space for more diverse behaviors. So I think that there will still be an appetite to go to the theater and to, you know, get dressed up and, 
you go for your dinner and, you know, th- because there's a whole social etiquette and social capital invested in, in theater experiences and in, and in artistic experiences in that way. You know, you want to have your drink at the intervals as you can discuss what you thought about it. You know, you want to kind of critique it all at the end. Um, but then there's also in a, in a different way, you know, people want to kind of be on their phones and having bite sized, you know, more casual engagements and more casual r- responses. Um, and then there's the kind of, you know, we want to, sorry, one sec, we want to, um, you know, watch stuff, stream stuff online at home where we, we don't have the time or we don't have the bandwidth to get all dressed up to go to the theater, but we do really want to see the play. Um, so we might just stream that at home in our pajamas. Mm-hmm. Um, I think I, it sounds a bit of a cop out, but I think there's room for it all. I actually, I do think that people, um, I think that experiences will get less formal. You know, I think if we even just look at how people interact in the workplace environment, you know, 10, 15, 20 years ago, you were in your suit and tie going to work. And now most offices are casual clothes. And now most people are working in their pajamas because they're working from home. Um, So I think that like, I think it's a societal thing as well as it is a, a cultural thing or, or a, an artistic thing. You know, I think that people with, with social media and with mobile phones and with the immediacy of communication, um, people seem to want to have a more natural, uh, less polished um, engagement. But that said, I think that um, organizations still need to make sure that the content that they're creating, like the, so the actual artistic content they're creating is created with the best professional rigor and, you know, with the best attention to detail that they can. Um, yeah. Um, to sum it up, people will allow for casual, but not for unprofessional. Yeah, I think people will allow for casual, but it has to be quality. Yeah. I think quality is key. Um, one to jump to, to, to another another topic. Um, one, one other thing that, that comes out of this, obviously we, we did have networking before and we will have networking in the future, one hopes at least. Um, I know, uh, I know has always been a part of that process. It, it is part of the DNA, right? Um, can, can you explain us a little bit about it, uh, the way you do network uh, at home and abroad? Yeah, um, so I guess like for me, networking a little bit is, is like about kind of collaboration. And, and I think that our, our opera in, at its core is, is a collaborative art form. So like to, to do opera, you have to be good at networking because you need to, you know, you need to have met all the directors and all the, you know, artists. You need to be able to plug into different networks of, of talent. Um, because there's so many different um, specialisms to use opera. Um, I think the opera world in general, there's a really strong network of professional opera organizations who are very supportive to each other. And there's there's a great kind of knowledge sharing network. Um, I think COVID, certainly for me, one of the, in the early days of, of this crisis, like one of the huge positives was that the network really kicked in. And so we're part of a European um professional network called opera europa um which you know just kicked in with dozens of webinars for every specialism in, in the administration and um, so you know you, you could connect in with your european colleagues in marketing or in production or in artistic direction um and that was just super supportive and super helpful and i think that relying on networks um can only be a positive thing and i think that feeding into networks you know it, it's a two-way uh, ecosystem you have to be prepared to to give to get back um, and I think that more pe- the more people do that the more important that is so like I don't think that that's really changed I think it's been strengthened mm-hmm. I think people are are more now well I certainly am more aware of the networks and more likely to engage with them um kind of in terms of digital like for us networks are really important because we're we're small um and we're only building our channels and our audience online so we have a relatively small um, organic reach. Um, so for us, connecting in with networks is really important. Um, opera Europa have a, a streaming platform called Opera Vision, which is a European collection of opera houses um, who stream and live stream productions from theatres. Uh, so we're a member of that, which allows us to reach all of their online reach and, and their network. So 
that's really important for us to do that and, and you know linking in with our national broadcaster making sure we're doing all that and kind of keeping those networks going and um, so basically for us networks are, are key and I, I think that was the that was the same before and it's the same now I don't think it's changed too much um, in, in terms of uh, projects um, one one people one at least one uh, big project you're you're in it's called traction you um, mm -hmm. Um, it has a Portuguese entity, um, but you're working all uh, over Europe, Spain, Ireland, uh, Portugal, can, and a few yeah. more. Can you please? Yeah. So, a um, really exciting project for us. Um, it's uh, in its first year, we kicked off in January. It's been a very strange experience <laughs> because we had one kickoff meeting in February and then went into lockdown at the end of March. So we've only met um, together as a proper team once. There's nine organizations involved, um, as you said, kind of in Portugal, Ireland, Spain, um, Holland and the UK. Um, and the idea is that we're developing new technologies and novel formats um, to reach uh, opera audiences. And, you know, we kind of recognize that opera is an art form that a lot of communities or people feel is not for them. And they feel quite excluded from the conversation of opera. They might not even know anything about opera. They don't kind of consider it as a, a valid tool for artistic expression or for self-expression. Um, and we're very interested in, in the way the technology can kind of influence that uh, discussion or that kind of um, process around how audiences engage with opera. Um, so there's three trials um, active in... Uh, Spain in the Liceo Opera House in Spain and um, Irish National Opera are one of the trials and then um, an organization called SAMP which is in Leria in Portugal. So each of the three trials will kind of experiment and use the technology with a different uh, to, to present a different type of opera. So we're all kind of creating our own individual operas. It's, it's, a, it's a huge project um, and it can be quite intimidating for some but, but basically for our part what we're doing is creating a virtual reality opera with communities around Ireland so kind of a lot of uh, Ireland has changed so much in the last 20 years we have a lot of uh, immigration we're traditionally a country that has experienced emigration throughout and now for the first time we have you know more people coming in than going out um and so we're we're kind of looking at the diversity of Ireland and how this changed landscape has affected people um, and trying to collect those stories and those experiences and present them in some sort of virtual reality opera. So it's really exciting in terms of our outreach um, work that we do. We, we have um, an education and outreach department uh, in INO, which uh, is only kind of really active in the last 18 months. Um, so again, we're very new and kind of engaging with communities and getting people interested in, in using opera as a way of to express themselves. Uh, so this project is really allowing us to get out into communities all around the country. And then hopefully we'll, we'll, we'll end up in us creating a really interesting uh, and new form of opera that, you know, not many people have explored. There's not many virtual reality operas. There's not many operas created specifically for this medium. Um, so we're very excited to see what comes out of it. Um, and, and in terms of, again, for us, it's, it's about reach. Like you can access a, an opera like this no matter where you are and have exactly the same experience as someone will have in Dublin or Cork or Belfast or wherever they're experiencing it. And, you know, if you talk about global reach, then this is something that will allow us to uh, reach audiences very much outside of Ireland because we feel with the international consortium and the networks that that provides us, this will allow us to push out beyond our own boundaries. Just, yeah. um, you started this way before there was the notion of a lockdown or a pandemic. Yeah. Um, when was it thought of and when would, will it end? Uh, when, you, yeah. when will you have the results? So the first... it's a three-year project. So we're due to present the opera um, in the middle of 2022 um, is what we're aiming for. So probably the first presentations of the opera will be around about May 2022. Um, and we started thinking about it. I mean, certainly when I started working at INO two years ago, one of the first things I looked at doing was, well, started researching about was doing kind of augmented or virtual reality um, opera, just because I think that it's important to, it's important to 
learn about the technologies or to it, to learn about the things that are on the limits of what you think is possible. So to kind of always keep an eye on on the outskirts of, of so where you are, what you're doing, but what's over there. Yeah. Um, and Vior at that time was definitely something way over there. Um, but I was I was kind of keeping an eye on a few different projects that were happening internationally that just seemed really in interesting and inspiring. And then we were approached by the consortium putting together the proposal for funding. So it's a Horizon 2020 funded program. And um, so there was a consortium putting it together and they asked us to come on board. And one of the key things in our proposal was immersive technologies. So when I kind of read the proposal, like, with all of the interest that I had around VR Opera, it just seemed to kind of fit really well together. So yeah, we were delighted to be asked to, to join the consortium and then delighted that we got the funding. Um, we're coming close to the to the dreaded uh, limit of time. Um, do, do you feel kind of reinventing the way people can perceive opera or opera can be made? Do you feel that responsibility? Um, I don't know if responsibility is the right word. Like, I'd like to think that we can challenge challenge people's notions of what opera is. Um, I think that opera is... Opera is an amazing art form, but it, it comes with a lot of baggage. I think that people have a lot of notions around, you know, there's a lot of negativity around kind of opera as, a, as an art form in terms of the cost of it. Um, you know, there's a lot of a lot of the old operas, there's a lot of troublesome themes in terms of, you know, misogyny and sexism. And, you know, there's, there's lots of kind of issues around opera that can be challenging when you're presenting it in the modern context. Um, so I would like to think that what we're doing with opera can certainly challenge how people, challenge people's notions of what they think opera is and, and invite them to explore it in a slightly different way. And if, if you're somebody who dismisses opera outright without ever really trying it, I'd like to think that we can present it to you in a way that will almost trick you into, <laughs> into getting into it or trick you into trying it for the first time and then you might see something you like. Um, and the notion of, again, if creating a community can opera, I never thought of it personally. Uh, when, when you speak about community building or um, strengthening community ties, I never thought of opera um, as the way to do it. Um, what kind of a community do you hope um, people that do participate know several skill sets, know the respect and the professionalism that it is needed to, to, to build an opera production or to, to put it together? Do you believe that could be, um, well, um, a more reasonable uh, community, a more um, calm community and not so speedy uh, in terms of results and in terms of necessities. Uh, because one of the things, to explain my question, one of the things people say is that, well, we do need bite-sized uh, content. Okay, yeah. fine. But we need a lot of them and we need them now uh, and not yeah. tomorrow. When building something like this and telling people, well, bear with us for three years, um, know what's involved and then uh, everyone can share. Do you think that notion of time and, and easiness uh, in terms of time will be essential for the communities of the future? Um, unfortunately, I think that no. <laughs> I think um, <laughs> I think that there will be different levels. Like so, the way I'm trying to focus is there's a huge pressure to, and I think that everyone felt this pressure when lockdown happened, and when we were all trying to keep relevant and keep communicating and there was this huge pressure to create 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 um and it kind of goes back to your question about casual casual content and stuff um i think that there's going to be a need for multi-layered strategies and i think that so for us we have our three-year project which is traction which is our kind of most ambitious most techno technologically um challenging and um you know needs the most kind of resources and all the rest of it so that's kind of at the top and then we have um you know kind of the digitally creative content that we've created during lockdown which was kind of you know fairly high investment you know had a strong artistic um narrative to it uh you know took time and took a lot of skills and a lot of resources um 
so that kind of came out, but came out, you know, in a relatively short space of time. It certainly wasn't years, it was weeks. Um, and then you have, and then you have your social media content that you really need to be, that just needs to fly. And, and I think that, I think it's really challenging. I think that digital channels are really, really challenging because the modern consumer, they see something once, they don't want to see it again, but they want to have a constant feed of video coming, coming at them. And, you know, there's a really challenging job for, for digital or for arts organizations who want to be um, relevant and up to date on digital to kind of have really creative people just putting out low maintenance, low cost, low resource content that is still quality. That's a really hard job to do, but I think that unfortunately that is kind of with us to stay for now. And maybe there will be a kickback against content, but at the moment, content is everywhere and content is necessary and it has to be original and it has to be meaningful. Um, so that's a really difficult job. And I think getting that balance between frequency and quality is really important. Um, so thank you so much for your words, for the insights uh, into INO and your job specifically. Uh, we do hope that uh, eventually in the coming years, we can have uh, a presentation or, or touch your opera presentation from Visio. Um, thank you. Thank you very much for your time. No problem. Great Until to chat. Until next time, all the best. Okay. Bye. Bye.